What happens when social systems evolve? I mean, what happens internally? How does this evolution actually progress inside society? Uh, it's different than biology evolves what happens inside here. How does it happen with the society? That's what we're going to look at uh, at this section. And we're going to go to the original source and the original writings. Josef Alois Schumpeter. Professor Schumpeter was the person who coined the phrase creative destruction. And creative destruction, you can use it as a synonym for innovation, actually, for the effect of, of innovation. It's new combinations, that's the definition of innovation, which leads to creative destruction. Schumpeter was an Austrian economist, a pretty flamboyant and charismatic character hanging around there in the, in the scientific sphere in the, in the early 1900s. According to him, he had three self-declared goals in life. He wanted to be the best horseman in Europe, the greatest lover in Vienna, and the best economist in the world. Now, according to his own judgment, he achieved two of these three goals, but he never told us which one. So <laughs> he left us guessing there, and I, I don't know, I, I'm not going to guess on, on that one. So two of the most influential books he left behind was Business Cycles, so he called these long waves, which we now call Schumpeterian long waves, he called Business Cycles, and Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. So more than just being in line with his flamboyant character, he didn't stick to the economics, he actually also made a theory of democracy of it, a market theory of democracy, which, which is very interesting. But let's read Professor Schumpeter directly. 1939, the history of capitalism is studied with violent bursts and catastrophes. We come to the conclusion that evolution is a disturbance of existing structures in more like a series of explosions than a gentle, though incessant transformation which have to become called as business cycles, in which, translated into the language of diagrams, present the pictures of undulating or wave-like movements in absolute figures or rates of change. All right, so he first of all tells us it's a pretty brutal process. Same as biological evolution is a pretty brutal process, right? The, the reason why the giraffe has a long neck is because there was a mutant and had a long neck and all the others died the ones with the short neck, and the ones with the long neck reached the better food source and had more offsprings and kind of like took over the other. It's a brutal process. You know, a lot of others had didn't, didn't make it in order for the giraffe to evolve by negative selection, a long neck. And so also this process of social evolution is a brutal process. Violent bursts and catastrophes. Catastrophe means that Things get destroyed, it's a series of explosion, disruptive innovation. And that ends, if you, in the language, depicted in the language of diagrams, it's these undulating waves that we've been seeing. As the process gathers momentum, these effects steadily gain in importance and in disequilibrium. Enforcing a process of adaptations begins to show. This is the process by which the effects of the entrepreneurial activity spread over the whole system dislocating values, disrupting the equilibrium that existed before. The term windfall expresses the character of both these gains and losses. So there are gains, the new things are created, and losses. In 42, he summarized it like that. The same process of industrial mutation, if I may use a biological term, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating the new one. This process of, and there it is, creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalism consists in and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. So this is the definition of creative destruction. And I think, okay, so now we, we did our duty. We read Professor Schumpeter, the original from the 1930s and 40s, but I think the term creative destruction is self-explanatory, right? So that's, that's just, it captures it very well what innovation does. It is a creative destruction. Now, one of the interesting facts is that creative destruction acts on many levels. So 
In other words, as Schumpeter says, there are many simultaneous cycles. So these undulating waves that you can depict, these explosions that do something that qualitatively transform the system, there are many of them. So he says it's an indefinite number of wave-like fluctuation which will roll on simultaneously and interfere with one another in the process. There are many fluctuations of different span and intensity which seem to be superimposed on each other. So, you know, it's, it's waves all the way down. <laughs> it's cycles upon cycles upon cycles that have been created on cycles from cycles from cycles. So it's waves all the way down and it's, it's waves all the way up. And there are different waves, shorter waves that create longer waves. So for example, there is product cycles. And there's the iPhone 10 and 11 and 12 and 20 and I don't know. And then there is longer waves of, well, what is actually the phone? So there is the flip phone and then there is the smartphone. Right, so this smartphone evolution is based on the different generation. And then there's the digital paradigm on top of all of this. Now, also these product cycles, actually you can go down there. It's like, how is the iPhone, whatever, 14 actually made? Well, it becomes out of the, the, the research cycle and the testing cycle and, the, and, and all the way down, it's also different waves. And Schumpeter says, there's an indefinite number of simultaneous waves of different waves. And just like little waves create big waves in the ocean. So also these little cycles create these big waves. The amazing thing, the impressive fact is actually that, you know, it creates these big waves in a very quite predictable pattern if you think about where they come from. So here in this video, I invite you to, to watch that. That's one specific application of creative destruction to one specific industry. Breaking the ice. Have a look at this little video. So let's have a deeper look at these long waves and break them down. So what I did here is I gave these long waves, these different Schumpeterian uh, contratives, um, different names and numbers. And here, let's look at the dominating general purpose technology. So we have water powered, steam powered, and electric powered, combustion powered, basically that's the petroleum paradigm, and digital technology. Now we look at the underlying scientific paradigm of it. So for example, water technology that went together with you know, classical mechanics and hy hydraulics. So Sir Isaac Newton and Pascal, for example, researched a lot on that. And as we already said in a previous lecture, usually technology and the scientific understanding of that goes hand in hand. So our understanding of hydrodynamics actually doesn't come from studying the fish in the water, it comes from building ships. So there is, you know, the in technology, and then we study the technology and we talked about the airplane and, and aerodynamics, for example. So they go hand in hand. It's not like one goes first. It's kind of like the, the, the chicken and the egg. Now, this created new infrastructure. It also redefined infrastructure. With the water revolution, we built canals. And these canals, then we had ships that were able to transport things a long way or mills. With these water mills, um, we were able to bake bread on an industrial scale, for example, bread mills and the mechanical cotton industry that used water wheels. And that lead to a lot of societal changes, changes in the conditions, the labor conditions in agriculture, for example, the amount of food by having, you know, having mills, helping mills to, to, to make bread, that accelerated the food production a lot. And the quality of clothes as well in the cotton industry, for example, with the creation of these water-driven machineries. Let's go to the steam revolution. And usually when people talk about technological revolutions, I don't know why they only pick these two. They usually is that it's the steam and then it's the digital. But, you know, it's a little bit more fine grained. And the steam engine is actually considered the second industrial revolution. Well, steam engine goes together with thermodynamics. We talked about that before, especially how Carnot actually, you know, discovered thermodynamics or conceptualized thermodynamics by studying steam engines, studying cannons. And Trains were already running all over, uh, all over the place before we understood what thermodynamics actually is and we, we ironed out the laws of thermodynamics. Now, of course, the infrastructure here is the railway, the coal transportation system and so forth. We need supporting services. We need to get the coal. We need to do more mining in order to get the coal into the trains and so forth. And this then created 
new sectors, especially also, again, in textile production, if you think about that, in our country here, that was in, in the United States, that was, that was very important and led to a lot of social change in the working conditions. Um, um, if you think about, you know, the Industrial Revolution in England, I mean, a lot of movies and books comes from this era. So we have a basic understanding of what was happening back then. But also there were changes in democracy. Because democracy depends on communication. If you want to make decisions together, we have to communicate. And before that, you know, in order to communicate, we had to get on the back of a horse and carry a letter or somebody had to talk it to you. And now we could get into a train. So big countries like the United States, which was already democratic, grew closer together with this advancement of train communication. Electrification, and we also talked about this already, how Faraday built their first electric motor 10 years before he wrote down his first equation. And then the famous Maxwell electromagnetic equ equations, that was 40 years later. But then once we understood electricity, whoa, did we make a science out of it? And it really boosted the new industries. And we lit up the entire country with Edison light bulbs, like literally. That had created a lot of new sectors, of course, with machinery that we created and a lot of machinery production uh, companies that are still around. For example, all the German engineering, Siemens, you think about that, that's the company, the biggest company that makes machines that other companies use to make things, for example, comes from that age. And that led to a lot of social change. Just think about how the light bulb changed our perception of night and day. Before that, we were pretty much in the rhythm like the rest of the animals. And it, when it became dark, we went to bed at 5 p.m. I mean, we had these candle things, but how many candles can you burn? But now with electricity, that completely changed. We got, we got quite independent from night and days. And factories were starting to run at night. We, we had night shifts and we continued you know, to be up until midnight. How crazy is that? We're still not sure if that's how healthy that thing is, but uh, we've been doing that. So it changed what a daily schedule looks like. Completely changed society. Motorization. That's still quite in the, in the not so far past. So we know about that very close to engineering together with the technological development, uh, with all the German engineers, Otto, Daimler, Benz, uh, the Wright brothers in flying here in the United States, Henry Ford here in the United States creating the, the assembly line. And, and so that really then created these, you know, these new infrastructures, also the roads we had to create and the supporting sectors we had to create. Think about the gasoline stations. Before that, there weren't any gasoline stations, so they had to grow. Currently, as right now, electric charging stations are growing and they're still not there yet. So if you think about, should I get an electric car? Well, do I have enough? Here in California, we have a good size of electric charging stations, but not everywhere, even in the country or in the world, do you have the supporting infrastructure to support the new paradigm. So gas station had to be created, same as nowadays, electric charging stations have to be created for electric cars. And the change of that is, of course, vast, the motorization. And, and not only in the industry. Think about, for example, now you could meet family for Thanksgiving. It's just, well, some people think it's great. Other people think it's great, but there's no more excuse. You can get in your car and even if there's no train running to where your folks are from, on Thanksgiving, you go there, right? And, and you visit family for the holidays. So it's not, I'm saying these exams because it doesn't only change the industry and the economy. Also the way societal fabric works, uh, family life works, is affected by, by these kind of revolutions. They're really societal revolutions and changes in, in corporate governance also as well happened there with, uh, with the combustion, with the combustion engine. And now in digitalization, of course, we talked a lot about that, the scientific discovery. I personally still, I'm a big fan of Claude Shannon, who single-handedly, I think, defined the digital age as the defining scientist. He conceptualized the bit, what is information in 19. 19- 48, and, and many others contribute, Alan Turing, uh, Wiener, Vannevar Bush, uh, and so forth, among others, John von Neumann, we mentioned that them throughout, throughout this uh, specialization, which led to many new redefined sector, telecommunication, and all, you know, the big industry, what we call now Silicon Valley or the Bay Area, the social media sector, and the artificial intelligence, the data analysis industries, and not talking about the digital, uh, the, the characters of the change. We have an entire two entire session, entire course on it. When you when we talk about digital innovations, 
and these digital characteristics and how they lead to social innovations. So that's how you can think about these long waves. Now, I went through this now extremely fast. I invite you to please pause for a second, look at this matrix a little bit more in detail and also come up with your own examples in order to really let it sink in, let it digest of how technology and society co-evolve. Come up with some own examples. Let's just pick one or two of these cells in this matrix and come up with your own examples to explain to yourself also what is actually going on there when society evolves. Now, let's look a little bit moving on. Let's move a little bit at this last column, the social change. How does this social change actually work? There we go to uh, one person that's been very important in, in my understanding of these top topics, Professor Carlotta Perez. Here we, we met at one of the conference, actually at the Schumpeterian Society, we met. And Professor Perez has been very influential in explaining, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of how these technological revolutions work. And I invite you to, to read this interesting articles of her, where in one of the figures, she lays it out very clearly. And I wanted you to walk, wanted to walk you through this figure. So first of all, what Professor Perez says is, there's the exhaustion of the prevailing paradigm. So there's something that we say like, that's fine, but it doesn't really like, that doesn't really work anymore. It really holds us back. It's a bottleneck. And there comes an economic and social pressure for change. Revolution, right? So you're kind of like, nope, that doesn't work. Something doesn't work. Often it's also an inequality. It's too big of an inequality. We, the masses say we are left behind and there's some kind of pressure that we have to solve something. So we search for new technological potential in order to, to solve something, the, the problem. And then once we have that, once we have a breakthrough, there this construction of the new paradigm starts. But usually, first of all, we are met with a lot of socio-institutional inertia. So the old powers kind of like say like, look, there's a fight going on. That's also why these revolutions are pretty brutal, leading to unemployment and new employment and reemployment, families going through waves up and down. You know, this is a quite uncertain time. Fortunes are made and fortunes are lost in this. And, and the powers to be, they won't give up power as easily. So they become, they become rich with the old paradigm. I don't know, think about the Rockefellers or whatever it was. Some, they come from a previous paradigm, right? And, you know, they're still very important powers, even now in the digital age, very important powers. And so also the old institutional framework, the institutions we have, not only the people, also the institutions, the laws that are in place that cater to the previous paradigm, they're not easily to be changed. So there we have this revolutionary battle going on, the economic and social pressure for change and the inertia of the old socio-institutional framework. Now, once this battle basically comes to a close and it's a pretty brutal process, then we start with the diffusion of the new common sense. We're kind of like, all right, okay, so we just use the internet for communication. It's actually fine. And when I started to research this, I told you when I started to research that in the United Nations, one of the first things they kind of like hand waverly put off that this digital thing in the, in the late 90s, it was like, look, we think about the world's problem in poverty. Nobody can eat computers. That's what I was told. So that's why, okay, it was good for me because they said, let the intern, let the new intern, I was very young in my very early 20s, like let the intern research that digital thing. That's not really something that's really of importance. And so, you know, they didn't take it seriously. Nowadays, of course, yes, it's, it's taken very seriously. And, but it took a long time. For example, we still grapple a little bit with, Digital signatures. A digital signature, actually, is that valid or not? Because now a personal signature, but now I have these digital signatures and we basically imitate, we imitate a handwritten signatures, right? When you're on the screen and you do like, what lines do you make? Is that really like, what, what sense does this actually make? So the new common sense is not really yet established. What you do when you take this little plastic pin on a monitor and you try to sign, or when you take a PDF and you copy, what are you doing? We're basically imitating, so is this really a digital signature? Like, is, okay, is it really unique or? But so we are still in this process, even with this, like is the new common sense, do we accept? What kind of authentication do we accept? 
with regard to the signature. So this takes some time and we're still in this process, the diffusion of the new common sense and what's actually acceptable there. And then there comes the social political process of the social construction of the new framework and the relaunching of the new economic growth and the deployment period. Now, linking it to the previous slide, Professor Perrin says, well, the deployment of each technology system involves several interconnected processes. So I just run over it in one, uh, in, in, in one little sweep, but you also have to make sure, such as I previously said, there need to be surrounding services to be created. So that's why it takes time. We had to create the gasoline stations. First of all, in order for the cars to be able to drive to the Thanksgiving gathering, you know, you needed gasoline stations basically everywhere. And we populated the entire country with that. You needed the cultural adaptation to the logic of this interconnected technological system. So among the engineers and the salespeople and the consumers and the politicians, we needed to understand what's going on. Think about this digital signature. Is it now accepted to have a signature and what kind of signature? Like what really proves, authenticates that? You agree with this transaction that you bought this house or this bag of chips in the supermarket store when you when you sign with your whatever you sign there on, on the little screen. And also then third, there needs to be the setting up of institutional facilitators. And in the digital paradigm, you're still in the middle of it. Lots of lawsuits going on, especially in our country here. Usually we litigate, right? We let the genie, we let the cat out of the sack, we let it run. And then if it does some harm, we take out the bit legal, ha legal hammer and we try to litigate it into its, into its cage again. And lawsuits are going on against social media companies, for example, against technology producers, against, you know, when, when an accident happens in autonomous driving, like what's going on? Who's responsible, uh, for example? Who's responsible for mental health outcomes when you start to get addicted to interacting with artificial intelligence? So we still have to set up these institutional facilitators. And that also takes time. When we first brought the cars onto the street and joined them with, to, with the horses that occupied the streets before, there wasn't a, a, a DMV. There wasn't a Department of Motor Vehicles. There weren't even traffic lights around or driver's license around. So we needed time to, to create that. It took a long time until we had driver's license and acceptable conduct in, in how to behave ourselves when we are on the street. And it still differs in different countries. When you come to an intersection, does the one on the right go first or does the one who came to the intersection first go first? That, that differs in different countries. So we are still in the process also of adapting that. And in the digital age, whew, do we have ways to go in order to go there? So as I said, so there are different layers to this, to, to this dynamic. And I encourage you, please read this article here and, and walk through this process yourself. In one of the exercises, we will also walk through this process ourselves. Now, let's see how this process unfolds in time, especially we can distinguish between two periods here. That what basically open, happens up here, the struggle, and then what happens down here after the diffusion of the new common sense, the relaunching of economic growth. In another article, which I also kindly invited to read, Professor Paris walks us how this works, these two periods that we can distinguish in one great search of social evolution. There's first the installation period that then ends with a big battle. We call it the, you know, the blow off top ends in a recession and then comes the deployment period. So first of all, installation, when the new paradigm gets established, there's a battle of the new versus the old paradigm, mainly get conducted by financial capital. So the financial capital is, financial capital is basically where should we put our attention, our economic attention like what what matters is the old stuff still matter or can we still do that and trust the old guys or what's this new stuff and actually can be trusted what's going on there and this usually end it ends in financial bubbles because we first don't trust the new guys we stick to our old guns but then we get so excited about the new possibilities and we put way too much into it but the technology is usually not prepared for it so we create these bubbles these blow off tops which are very characteristics for, for these social, technological, economic revolutions, which then end in a recession. So this is how society breathes, right? It end, but it's driven by our emotions, actually. We like get so excited and it goes up and then it falls down and we end in a recession. And that can take quite some time until then this new common sense gets established 
which then leads to the employment period. And now we've got used already a little bit more to it. Okay, so that's how we do things. We can communicate digitally. It doesn't solve everything, but it's actually quite comfortable. Um, we can do a video conference and we can save ourselves a trip. Well, actually, and that has become common practice now. And which leads then this deployment period to the full expansion of the new paradigm conducted by, by, by more like the production process. And I also invite you to watch this video here that I link where Professor Paris actually much better than I ever could walks us through this and especially the aspect of financial bubbles, which are so important. And you hear about that in the news, the bubbles and the recessions which Schumpeter called business cycles. That's why Schumpeter called these long waves business cycles. And financial bubbles is not only a thing that right now a financial bubble is just is there, is bubbling up, is, has just been passed and so forth. They're just characteristic of technological revolutions when they permeate society. And they've always been. So let's look historically at the second contrative, the steam engine long wave. Here is the founding of railroad companies in Massachusetts in the 1850s. So 1850s in Massachusetts alone, in this one year they founded more than 15, 17 railroad companies. And here the next year, oh, they only founded 15 additional and then 16 additional. I mean, how many railroad companies can you have in Massachusetts, like seriously? <laughs> now, of course, nowadays, we don't have these hundreds of railroad companies anymore, but there's been quite some excitement. And the people who study that, they talk about organizational ecology. So it's a biological and evolutionary process that we try different mutations. We try many different railroad companies, selection, and then retention. The evolutionary logic, mutation, selection, retention, mutation, selection, retention. So here we just mutate. We bring on many mutants onto the market. Now, most of them have to die. It's a brutal process. And then some will make it. And we can also see, let's, let's jump forward to the fourth contrative, to the fourth industrial revolution, car manufacturers. You can see here that the number of car manufacturers in the United States, uh, here that is in the year, let's say 1910, we had 350 car manufacturers. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, 350 car manufacturers. I mean, how many are left nowadays? So you can probably count the, the car manufacturers on one hand. Oh, we got a new one recently, Tesla. I mean, that completely rallied up the market because before we only had Ford and General Motors. Now we have a new one, like, okay, so now it's maybe a handful, but we had 350 of them. A lot of different mutations. Most of them didn't make it, and that not only in the United States. If you go to the other side, to Europe, you had here in Germany, you had 80, and in France, you had 150. So, okay, so you have here 350, 400, 500, 600 car manufacturers in the world. Like, who were they thinking they were producing for? We only need about 10, and that's what we still have. 10 different car manufacturers with the big ones, and there's a lot of consideration, but we needed to select the big ones. So it's mutation, selection, retention. That's what's going on. Now, jumping to the digital age, we see something very similar. And in the digital age, we also have the different waves. So let's go to the first wave of the digital age, information, communication, and data. And here they usually we talk about the dot-com bubble. That's what it's called it's from, the, from the early 2000s, the dot-com bubble crashed. The NASDAQ, the tech stock market was just was going up, was exploding, as you can see here in the U2000, going extremely high and then crashing down. And this was because the dot-com, the first companies went online. For example, pets.com was really, I remember, it was the hottest thing. People was like, oh yeah, I gotta invest into pets.com. And another big company came around, but nobody really, we didn't know it was a big company, came around amazon.com. Amazon was just a book selling company at the time. So what they did, they set up their dot-com, communication, they joined the communication revolution and went on the market. And Amazon, the stock went up in the year 2000, it went extremely high as you can see, and then came crashing down. Now, in the year 1999, Jeff Bezos was crowned to be the person of the year in only a few years that he had his company where people started to see the potential of this technology. You could sell books, and that's all he sold back in the days, just books online. 
and he fought against Barnes and Noble, and that was Barnes and Nobles was the established power to be, and Amazon was fighting with it. And the big question was, could Amazon ever stand up to big Barnes and Nobles, the brick and mortar company, as I remember they called them, against the dot com uh, companies. And that battle went on, and the Got, people got very excited about it, invested a lot. They started to see the potential, but the technology couldn't keep up and it crashed. And it crashed for a long time. It took 10 years for Amazon to recover. So the height it had here in the year 2000, that's the stock market price of Amazon, was about $5. And then it crashed down to about 30 cents. Now get that. Now that is a bubble that bursts. So if you invested $500 into Amazon up here on the top of the bubble, then you're like, okay, so this is the newest thing. Now the FOMO kicks in, you know, the, the fear of missing out kicks in. You're like, okay, I got to invest 500 bucks, going to put it in Amazon. A few months later, it completely crashed and you only have $30 left. So your $500 went up in smoke and now you have $30. Well, maybe you can buy yourself a good meal, but that was what happened to your $500. Very disappointing. So people really got disappointed. It's like, okay, so Amazon, that really doesn't work. We went way too fast. But it was not the fault of, the, of, of Amazon. It was the fault about human emotions, the FOMO, the fear of missing out. We overestimate the potential. And Professor Paris talks a lot about that in her writings, how we, we overestimate the potential. We become overly optimistic. But the technology is not mature enough yet. Now, it took a long time for this technology, for the online e-commerce solution to actually develop. And most of the time, well, the stock recovered as well. And but we said, okay, well, maybe it's worth $2.50. So it's still 50% down from $5. And this is a decade here, 10 years from the year 2000. Most of the early 2000s, the Amazon price was at about $2.50 on average. And only in 2010, 10 years later after it crashed, it recovered, you recovered your $500 if you didn't freak out in the meantime and sold everything, right? If you just, you know, dime in hand, hold on to it for a decade, then you would have your, your $500 back at the end. So these recessions, but these recessions are also very important. They weed out the mutations that don't work. That's why it also comes down, it comes crushing down. And I, I don't think pets.com is around anymore. And all of them are thousands and thousands of online companies that actually had to be wiped out. Just like many mutants in biological evolution, there are many mutants, but most mutants are basically disabled. So we, we classify them as disabled. Now, some mutations, some mutants turned out to have superpowers. They can do something that others cannot. They, in biology, have more offsprings and they become the dominating new definition of the species. Same as here. We had many, many, many online services, and the vast majority of them had to be wiped out. And the, the organism that we call the economy or society does that by these processes. That's how it breathes, right? It goes up, it goes way too fast, and then it comes down, kind of like, let's, let's, let's clean that out a little bit. And then it reemerges, like, oh, like the phoenix from the ashes, and it took 10 years for Amazon to reemerge but check out what happened then. So all of this 10 years, I now have to bring it down or not, this was the $5 to the $2.50 to the $5. What happened after the year 2010? That's when the deployment periods happened, when the new common sense got established and what Professor Paris calls the golden age. In that case, the golden age of the dot coms, right? So now your $5 turned into almost $200. So that's, uh, that's almost a 40x to use, you know, gambler's lingo here. So your $500 now would be $20,000. And you know, just a little time ago, they were $30. So now that really shows that people, and that's, it, it went up so much because people started to value the service that Amazon provides as much. So you can clearly see that's, you know, the breathing run. First of all, there was the excitement, but actually this excitement, like you don't even see this here anymore, right? This little blip here and then it went down. It also doesn't really matter. What happened is then this growth here, and that's the potential of the unleashing of the new paradigm. And you can actually make, uh, you can trace this back to the psychology 
of market cycles. So I'm in the stock market and in Wall Street and so forth. That's how they classify the bull and bear market. So the bull, which goes upwards with the horns and the bear goes downwards, stands up and then, and then goes down. So you have here, you start going upwards in the bull market with the optimism and you say like, oh yeah, that's really something going on. Ending up in the euphoria, that's the blow off top is like, this is too much, it's, that's hype. That's just like completely hyped up. And you know, the, if you think like everything now that goes to the moon, this will change everything, but it's not there yet. And then two people get too optimistic, too many ventures get created. There are too many mutants running around and it becomes a little bit too much. We, we cannot hold it. And then inevitably skepticism sets in and it crashes. The bear market comes and it crashes. It's basically an emotional, it's an emotional game that happens here. And you can see that, for example, more recently or currently, you can see that especially in the cryptocurrency market. So that's another one of these new things, right? These blow off tops, these bubbles that are going. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this current paradigm of, of, of the cryptocurrency busts and bursts, just because you can see so nicely how these busts and bursts, these waves of social economical evolution actually play out. And one interesting aspect of that is that you can see this Schumpeterian notion of the indefinite number of waves and waves upon waves upon waves, smaller waves and bigger waves, and that actually make up this structure here. And one of the theories is, is that they are driven by human emotions and human emotions actually follow a fractal structure. So there's my emotion that then affects a larger group of emotions and a larger group of emotions. And that leads to really predictable fractal structure. One of these methods called the Elliott wave methods and I'm not here to teach that exactly just the idea is to show you one additional way of how you can look at that that is used also in the financial market by by some serious traders and that has to do it's in line with mapping out this idea of waves of progress so let's talk about the cryptocurrency market. Actually, I will not talk about the cryptocurrency market. I will just interview some people who really know about that. And the first one we'll talk about is Dr. Benjamin Cowan. Benjamin Cowan is actually, it's a real YouTube star. So it's an honor to have him here on my show, <laughs> show I will say, here in our, in our course. And uh, he has this very popular YouTube channel called Into the Cryptoverse. So here we go. Let's ask Dr. Benjamin Cowan about what how he refers to these different business cycles especially comparing the dot-com bubble with the current and ongoing cryptocurrency evolution 